I'll just give like the geometric intuition of it and just give you the definition. Set in Rn is a complex set. Coit E such that okay, let's say such that the set contains a unit line on each direction. Line segment on each direction. So symbolically, what it means is that okay, for all E in the S minus one dimensional sphere, um, there exists a point in Rn such that that point plus a scalar times E is in the Kakea set, so-called Kakea set, for all T between negative half and half. And okay, let me directly tell you our what our ultimate goal is. So that's called Kakea conjecture. Saying that a Kakea set in Rn has house the Dimension n. Okay, so let me explain a little bit. Um, if this is the first time you see Kakea set, this, this might not be a surprising fact because um, we, we are considering a set in Rn. So um, it's very reasonable to say, okay, that that set with some property has dimension n because it's in, in space Rn. Um, but here, I, I skip one important fact about KKSL, which is that there exists a Lebesgue measure zero KKSL. So it, it can actually vanish um, in, in a sense of Lebesgue measure. So here, um, pr provided that fact, that this statement here is kind of non trivial. We're saying that although it, it could vanish in the sense of Lebesgue measure, but it still has the full dimension. Okay, and in, in general, um, I I define Kakea as a compact one, and I use house of dimension as my dimension. But in general, you know this conjecture is pretty vague. You you just want to prove a complex uh, a Kakea set has dimension n, but you, you can choose a favorite dimension and uh, and the set of admissible set. You can do measurable or you know, you, you can do Minkowski dimension. As long as you can prove that, that, that would be a great achievement. Right. But, but here, my choice is house of dimension and complex set. Yeah. For, for the sake of convenience. <coughs> okay, so, um, okay. Uh, I'll elaborate the definition of house of dimension when I, when, when I actually get down to prove this, because it, it's gonna be a bit complicated. Um, so, all right. But that, that's all about this Kakea set. Any question? I'm going to jump back and talk a star form for analysis and move gradually to, you know, Kakea set. Okay, so, so for the next maybe half an hour to an hour, it is going to be completely analysis. Uh, so for uh, definition, Fourier transform um, is formally um, F. Um, th th this hat means Fourier transform. <laughs> F Fourier transform C is R N. Um, okay, so 
Oh, oh, yeah, of course. Uh, thanks, yes. Okay. So uh, I, I need to first make sense of this because um, the, this is just a formal definition. So uh, you can see that um, the, the, this interbrand is obviously complex. It, it might, might not be a real thing. And, and this multiplier here, this multiplicative uh, term here, e to the sum real number times i, only changing the angle of the complex number. So that means that this term will not change the magnitude of this interbrand, uh, which implies that um, f absolute value of f of x, uh, oh sorry, f for the transform of c is going to be less than or equals to the integral of absolute value of f, right? Um, the, 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 this is quite obvious from the definition. Um, okay, Let, let's say, okay, then L infinity norm of this is going to be less than L1 norm of f. Okay, L infinity norm of Fourier transform is less than L1 norm of the original function. Um, right, uh, so that, that means for all L1 function, its Fourier transform is well defined. Right? Um, so, um, okay, I, I would say for all f belong to L1, the, the definition is, is okay. Okay, and also there is a more, a little bit involved theorem, okay, but, but, but I guess everyone knows it. But Venturel theorem saying that um, L2 normal for a transform equals to L2 normal back. So that means for a transform is a isometric isomorphism from L2 to L2. Um, okay, what does this imply? So this plus this, um, the, the, there is a, um, a little bit deeper theorem in analysis can somehow interpolate between these exponents so that now I, I can claim for a transform f hat um, L P prime norm is less than or equals to L P norm of for uh, for L P norm of F, uh, where the relationship between P prime and P is that they just conjugate number to each other. P is precisely. Yes, and P is between one and two. As you can see, that P equals to one is. Uh, the inequality on, on, the, on, on the top, and p equal to 2 is the equality on, on the bottom. And I'm interpolating between 1 and 2, which generates p, and interpolation between 2 and infinity, that generates p prime. Okay, okay. so the, this actually tells us that for a transform is well defined for all LP functions. Why? Be because for all this, uh, for all very nice functions, let's say, compactly supported, smooth function, we have this inequality. So um, this is true for all f belongs to c, c infinity. Here, this c means compactly supported. It, it, it is non-zero only in a compact set. And infinity means it, it's infinitely differentiable. So for all su such very nice function, this is true. But CC infinity function is dense in LP or LP prime. So we, we can do a tribute you know, linear extension to the whole LP space. Right. So, so uh, for a transform of F, for a generic F in LP, P between 1 and 2, uh, we would define this to be the limit in, in LP prime. Um, limit in LP prime of N, here, the, 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 this is Fn. Um, Fn it is a sequence that approaches F in LP. You, you can do this uh, canonical analysis trick to, to define for a transform of F for a generic LP function. Okay, so um, the, 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 this is just making for a transform rigorous, and also we're going to use interpolation theorem later, so I, I will want you guys to be exposed to this theorem. Um, okay, so the, 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 this is just a 
uh, beginning of our restriction conjecture. So once we have the Fourier transform, now, okay, I'm gonna state a small property. So um, F for a transform, and then for a transform again at x is equals to F, um, the reflection of the function. So I would say that this is true for all F. Actually, this is true for all function that's well defined, uh, whose for transform is well defined. And the proof of this is that I need to use the fact that um, um, the inverse for a transform, let me you use this wedge to, to denote it. The inverse, uh, the inverse for a transform is defined as um, e to the 2 pi i x dot c f of c d c and uh, Fourier inverse theorem states that for all such function f for a transform then inverse for a transform is f right. the fact that that's why we call it inverse for a transform and you can see that the only difference between inverse for a transform and for a transform is that we don't have this negative sign. Um, that, that means um, if you do for a transform twice in, instead of this, you just flip the sign of x. That, that, that's why this property is true. Um, okay, pr provided this theorem, which is non trivial to prove. Okay. Um, <clears throat> All right, so now um, the interesting question, which is directly related to restriction and conjecture, is that um, now I have these bounds for generic LP function. I want to ask if I restrict for a transform F on a measure zero set, um, then consider it's no, um, L, Q, no, of course, um, on the, the sphere, and is it less than C, P, Q, and L, P, no, of F for some P and Q? <coughs> so I, I, I w want to ask if there exists a pair P, Q such that this inequality is true for all F in L, P. So, um, so, first of all, I need to make sense of this, right? Well, what does it mean by a, for, uh, by a function on a measure zero set? Because for a generic LQ function on a measure zero set, uh, that function is not defined. So, uh, again, the, the canonic trick we used before, you first, uh, if the, the, this is true, you first prove it for CC infinity function. So for continuous function, um, okay. If f hat is continuous, then f hat is well defined um, as n minus one. Then you you use this trick again to make sense of a generic um, for a transform of f. <clears throat> yes, we are we are putting p as a like less than two only. Oh, yeah, uh, of course. Uh, in order to make sense of F for a transform, you need to make sure that P is between 1 and 2. Uh, but, uh, um, okay, so, so P between 1 and 2 is, is the requirement we need um, <coughs> that this kind of inequality help. But, but in general, um, if, if you really want to restrict this thing on, on a small set, uh, I, I, I guess we, we can use other p, p greater than 2. It's it also okay. Because we only care about the value of for a transform of that on a small set. So, so that the, the next thing is obviously smaller than you know, the LP norm, uh, LQ norm of that on the whole space Rn. So there, there's a hope that this could be smaller than you know, uh, LP norm of that even for p greater than 2. 
So um, th 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 this is actually not needed as long as you can prove. Okay. Okay. Um, and then in order to state the conjecture, I need one more trick, uh, uh, and that trick is also essential in our. Um, how is the uh, left hand side is less than equal to the Fourier transform in LQ? <coughs> uh, yes. Oh, 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 you, 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 you're right, you're right. Well, we're using d different measure. So, so, um, yeah, right, right. I, I, I don't know this. So here, I, I'm using the n dimensional, n minus one dimensional house. <coughs> but, but for this one, I'm using the Lebesgue measure. So they, they're using different measure. I'm using different measure, so they are actually different objects. So yeah. um, they're just not comparable in general. Right. Sorry. What's this house of measure you're using? Oh, so um, that, that measure, uh, so what I said is it, a very fancy name, but, but there, there's a simpler, you, you can say it's just you are integrating on a sphere. Okay, so it's just like normal. The, 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 the normal way you inst integrate okay. on the n minus one dimensional sphere. Right. <coughs> okay, so, mm, all right. Then, okay, I'm going to erase these. May I repeat the definition? Uh, do I really need definition? No, I, I don't need that. <coughs> okay. And then, uh, I, I claim that, okay, by, by, you, by a <coughs> notationally improvement, I can write this as, um, F for a transform L Q of mu is less than equals to C P Q and L P norm of F. Uh, when when I did not specify what the domain is, that means the Lebesgue measure on the whole R n. But, but here I did specify what the measure is. Means I'm integrating with respect to this measure. But what, what is this measure? This measure is just concentrate on the n minus one dimensional sphere. So here I'm taking this mu to be, um, you know, the um, how would I say? So a d mu is actually um, so uh, the characteristic function on s minus one the House of measure, um, but this again is the fancy way to write it. But it, it's just a normal thing. Um, the, the normal way you do integration on the n minus one sphere. Right. <coughs> okay, <coughs> but but of course it, it, it is a measure. It, that's important, right? Um, so I, I can write it like this as long as I consider a different measure, and I claim that this is equivalent to. F mu for transform um, oops, L P prime less than C P Q N uh, this is should be L Q prime mu. Right. So I claim that this fact is true. So these two <coughs> statements are equivalent. Then I'll show you this claim. Um, so proof. Oh, okay. Be be before we start the proof, you can see that um, this statement is a little bit easier to prove than this one because for this one, all the difficulty are put on the left hand side. But here, uh, if we look at this inequality. Um, integrating f with respect to mu and integrating the Fourier transform f times mu on the space on the whole Rn. So, so here I, I don't really need to integrate on mu. In, instead of that, I put mu into the integral. Right. So, and well, what does it mean by a function times a measure then Fourier transform? Uh, it's just uh, f first of all you you view f 
times mu as a measure. Uh, how how th does it work? So um, g d f mu is just g times f d mu. That, that's how you view f times mu a as a measure. And the uh, Fourier transform of a measure is just defined as, okay, for formally what I just written down. So C is um, e to the negative 2 pi i x c um, f d mu, okay, f of x d mu of x. Um, uh, again, if mu is a finite measure and uh, say f is now infinity, then that thing is well defined. We can see that. Because the right hand side is integrable. Okay. So, um, the, um, so if you view mu as a function, then for a transform of that is formally the same as what, what we had before. Okay, so now I'm, I'm, I'm going to convince you why um, my claim is true. So okay. instead of proof, I would say idea, because I'm not going to elaborate every detail, but, but tell you the idea why that is true. <coughs> so first of all, there is a well-known fact in functional analysis saying that um, if t is linear t x to y, uh, both x and y are the next spaces. And t is a linear operator from Banach space to Banach space. Then um, the norm of t, uh, okay, a as a operator, linear operator from x to y, is the same as the norm of its adjoint operator uh, in uh, the, the norm is from y prime to x prime. So, and the way we define a joint operator is that um, t, so you see that t star f, so uh, for f in y prime, t star f is something in x prime. x prime means dual of x. So there's a natural dual pairing between an object in x prime and an object in x. And we define this to be the dual pairing between f and tg. You can see that um, f is in y prime, g is in x, so tg is in y, it's in y prime, is in y, so this is a dual pairing in y prime cross y, it's a dual pairing in x prime cross x. Uh, is that true? Yes, okay. Right. So it's Pretty, pretty natural to define this operator. It, it's just like the, the transpose of your matrix. If these are all you know linear mathematics uh, in the finite dimensional space, so a joint it is just transpose. So that, that's why their norms should be the same because you you are just transposing your matrix. Right? Um, okay. So then I'm gonna use this fact to prove that. Um, so now my T is. Uh, let me see. My t is mapping from the function, map, maps a function in LP to its Fourier transform in LQ of mu, right? Right, okay, LQ of mu. So then t star, uh, okay, let me call it t transpose. So t adjoint t transpose maps from L Q prime mu. Um, okay, let, let's say that this function is f. It should map to something in L P prime. And what is that something? Let, let's just compute it by using definition. So, by definition, t star of f g equals to you know. Um, F T G right. Um, okay, I, I need I need to understand what 
what space F and G lies in and what the dual pairing really means. <coughs> so here in this case, um, T star F is in, T star F is in <coughs> B prime. So I, I set my G to be some function in LP. And so since for a function in LP, its image is in LQ. So this is in LQ. And, and I know my F is in LQ prime. Right. So uh, everything makes sense. And this is uh, the, the dual pairing between an LP, uh, between two functions is just the, you know, multiply together and do integration. So this is um, T star F times G. Uh, dx equals to, okay, so this is f times tg. tg is for a transform of f. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So tg is for a transform of g. Um, then d mu, right? Because these are all, yeah. <coughs> these are all you're using a different measure, the mu measure. Um, and then, okay, if um, mm, now I want to use a, a little, little bit fancy trick about for the transform, which says that um, h1, h2, dx equals to h1 for a transform, h2 for a transform, dx. The, this can be derived uh, using the Plancharov's identity. Because Plancharov's identity is saying that L2 norm equals to L2 norm. So their inner product should also coincide. And the, the, this is the inner product in the, for, in, in the you know, frequency space, the forward transfer space. This is the inner product in the original L2 space. Right. OK, so and here, uh, what this really means is, you see, uh, I have, I, I, I want to put, let me write it like this. D F. And then I want to put for a transform on both of them. So that gives me for a transform F mu times G for a transform for a transform DX. Okay. The, 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 this is just formally correct. You need to make okay may, make sense of this. Well, well, why can I do this? Because the, 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 this is slightly different than this. Uh, since the measure is involved. But formally, it, it, it's just this uh, equality derived by uh, Plancharov's identity. Okay. If, if, we, uh, if we print this, then, uh, and I also told you that double for a transform is just like a reflection. So this is just, um, a reflection, reflection of f mu times g dx. Right. Because g double for a transform is the reflection of it. But then we, we can reflect uh, both integrands so that the integration will not change. Right. So in, in, instead of reflect this function, I reflect this function, so that becomes Okay. Uh, now, okay. Now I know that this object is just a reflection of Fourier transform f times mu. Um, okay. So instead of proving this inequality, I, I just need to prove, you know, the reflection of f mu for a transform um, l p prime is less than c f. LQ prime mu. But you know, LP prime of the reflection of that is equals to the LP prime norm of F mu for a transform. So we, we, we just need to prove this. And, and that, that idea somehow supports this claim. So we, we, uh, we just sometimes call this T, T star R argument. And, and there, there's a more interesting fact that um, 
um, you you can also prove T T star. You will look at the, this operator and prove that this operator is bounded, and then the, the, this would imply T is bounded. But I, I I will not elaborate on this. It, it's just for uh, for those who are for those of you who are curious with it. Okay. So yeah, that that's all I need, and uh, here's the idea behind it. A any question? What would you say about T T star? Oh. Okay, so, um, so for T T star, uh, um, you see that um, T is from L P to L Q, and T star <coughs> is from L Q prime to L P prime. But if Q is two, say if Q is two, then Q prime is also two. Then <coughs> the, these two space coincide. Then you, you can make sense of. Uh, let me see. Yeah, so, so now T star T makes sense, right? T star T makes sense because the image is in L2 and you, you then map from L2 to another space. So, and you, you can prove that um, the boundedness of this operator is equivalent to the boundedness of T. So, so that um, by viewing, okay, by using this operator, you're mapping a function from LP to LP prime. And both of them does not involve, you know, both of them are not doing integration and also we are magic. They're using a bit magic. So that's how simplified this argument a lot. So if Q is two. Another equivalence. Right, right, right. Space might be uh -huh. but, but that's only true when Q is two. So, but, and, and I'll not use it here, so I'll not prove that. But, <laughs> but the idea is, again, you're using the, you know, a joint operator and somehow plays with the function. So um, the, this fact is important. Um, let me see. Then um, can, can I just erase this board because this board is just an idea behind that claim. I'm not going to use it anymore. Oh, I erase it. <laughs> Now, I'm able to tell you what the restriction conjecture is. Restriction conjecture says that uh, for a transform of F mu LP, Rn is less than CNP, FLP mu, where mu, you know, it is the it is the mu we define above uh, on that board, the n minus one has to measure on the sphere. Um, this is true for all f in L P of mu. And although, of course, I need some condition on p. So provided p is between um, infinity <coughs> and uh, two n n minus one. <coughs> Okay, so this is the restriction conjecture. Okay, and then, um, since th this is just a conjecture, I certainly don't have a proof for that. Um, okay, I I I'll pr provide you with something that I, I, I can talk about. Okay, so um, here's the theorem. Okay, and, and my ultimate goal is to somehow pass from this conjecture to the other conjecture, which is the Kakea conjecture, right? If you still remember that. Um, okay, that, that's behind this board, and we'll see it. Um, so, this is from Stein and Thomas. So, FF is in LP, um, 1 less than P less than 2M plus 2 over M plus 3. Okay, it's some junk um, the containing on dimension, then um, L2 of mu is less than C P N. Uh, and we know this is equivalent to F mu for a transform L P prime norm R N. <coughs> L2 norm of F 
with respect to mu. Okay. Um, so to, 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 um, for the, uh, if you are learning analysis, you can try to prove that. The proof of this is just using some property of force transform and raise story into relation theory. Yes? Is it the same constant? Uh, let me see. Yes, the, the same constant. Good, because they're just you know, a joint operator. Um, okay, so I, I'll not prove it yet. So I only have half an hour left. So um, let me see. So here, um, here is one. Yes, I have a question. So uh, what's the bound of a bound the involving n that's given? Uh, what kind of like interpolation? Oh, how is this constant dependent? No, 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 no the, the p up about p. Oh, oh, oh okay. Yeah, so, so kind of now, then now uh, I'm going to tell you this. So here, here's the important remark to answer Kenneth's question. <coughs> The, 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 this theorem um, is optimal in the sense that p cannot be greater than this number. So for all p greater than this number, the, the, there exists a function such that the theorem fails. Okay. So I'll provide you the function now. So it's called NAPS example. NAPS example. Okay. And I'm um, considering this object. So this is the S n minus one sphere. And I'm looking at the cap of it with height um, the delta square. Right. Uh, OK. Formally, it, it is just, OK, I'll call it this cap C delta. So C delta is just. Um, x belongs to s n minus 1, such that 1 minus x dot e n is so less than or equal to delta squared. Okay, so that, 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 that's just this cap here. And my counterexample is the function f equals to um, characteristic function of this cap. Okay, so you, you, you know what's going to ha happen afterwards. I'm going to compute um, L2 mu norm of f and LP prime norm of f mu for a transform. Okay, that, that, that's also, of course, an example of how you compute this kind of object. Okay, so, um, so f is this, and I'm going to consider Consider C belongs to Rn such that Cn is less than C1 divided by negative 2, and Cj is less than C1 divided by ne negative 1, where C1, okay, C1 is small enough. Um, to be more specific, I need C1 less than maybe 1 over 6n, yeah, some, some number depend on the dimension. Okay. And then you can see that, uh, okay, this is to compute the left hand side, right? So, for a transform of f mu as c is by definition um, okay, so okay. Let, let me write this down in the next step. C um, D. So the, the, this is just a normal integration on a sphere. Um, I'm, I'm using the, the fancy term, but it, it, it's the same. And also here, f disappears because f is just the characteristic function on C delta, and C delta is a subset. It's a proper subset of the sphere. So now instead I'm just integrating up, up on the cap and that just follows directly from, from that mission, right? Okay. Um, if you guys agree with this, then I'm gonna act, uh, provide a lower, lower bound estimate on this term, on this object. So I'm gonna multiply by Minus E n right here, I think. 
this C, then E, H, and minus 1. So I'm just multiplying this integral by the constant, which is E to the negative 2 pi i E n dot C. That, that's a constant that d does not depend on x at all. So that will not change the magnitude of the integrand, so that will not change the, you know, the integration, the, the magnitude of the integration. Right. So they're still equal. I'm honest here. And then, okay, so this is greater than or equals to integration of C delta, the cap, cosine 2 pi x minus dn dot c dh n minus 1. And, and also, x minus dn dot c absolute value is just sum from 1 to n minus 1 um, x i x c i. Okay, I would say less than equal to plus x n minus e n n right uh, by by the picture here we know you know the the vertical difference is at, at most delta square this term is less than delta square <coughs> this term is less than c1 delta to the negative two um, this term is less than delta c delta this term is less than c uh, okay this is actually, you can, you can compute that. This is less than square root of 2 times the, the delta. And this term is less than c1 delta to the negative 1. So I think 6 might not be enough. Let me put 12 here. Okay. Um, then I, I want to say this is less than 1 over 6. So as long as that constant c1 is small enough, I can say, okay, this angle within cosine um, is small enough. So cosine is big enough, right? Why is that What? Why is uh, Why is from this step to this step? Yeah. Oh, because uh, um, are you just taking the real part of the? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just taking the real part of the. Yes. So the, the, this is cosine plus i sub. But I say the real. Part. Yeah, I'm thinking if this cosine could be negative, no, it, it cannot be negative. It will always be positive. Uh, yes, because because. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. Right. So so could, could, could this, this expression here is small enough so cosine is always positive. Okay. So now I prove you that. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I prove you that it, it's always less than 1 over 6. So cosine of 2 pi times 1 over 6 is cosine pi over 3, which is a half, right? So this is greater than a half the volume of C delta, which is um, okay, greater than a constant times delta to the power of n minus 1. Because you know C delta is the volume of this cap, which is proportional to the delta n minus 1. Uh, and also, um, also, oh, okay. So let me finish this off. Uh, computing this LP prime norm of F mu or transform that should be greater than C delta m minus one. That that's how big the unit. Yes, this is. It, this might be nothing, but it, isn't that part x one minus x n like dot product e n? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Isn't it like oh, it the, should the, be the, one. The, the, this is not dot product. The, this is just multiplied. But uh, yeah, well, what's the question? I mean, I mean, if you put dot product over there, then you have one one from n minus term, and then you have the <laughs> n term, right? Mm -hmm. isn't it right, 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 right. So it should be like one. Oh, oh, oh so, sorry, sorry. The, the, this should, should, should be one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should be one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's a typo. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Everybody with me? Right. Okay. So then, um, this is how big the integrand is, and then I'm evaluating this. Um, let me see. Okay. 
I'm actually considering all C <coughs> such that C is satisfies this condition. But what are these conditions mean? So that just means a uh, let, let me draw it here. A rectangle with length um, uh, um, C1 delta to the negative 2 and width um, C1 delta to the negative 1. Right? So the volume of that, okay, uh, note that there are actually n minus 1 of those who win. Right? This is an n dimensional re rectangle. So the volume is delta to the negative m plus 1. Or, yeah, let, let, let me write it down. So delta to the negative m plus 1. But, but I'm considering I'll be prime norm, so I will divide this by, by p prime. And th this is a lower bound for our p prime norm of f mu for trans. Is that clear? Did this part take care of the integrand? And did this part take care of how big? So the, the region we are integrating on? Where's the first, first of the uh, term? Uh, here, P okay, here, here, here is the thing. So for the integral, we raise it to the power P prime, and, and then we, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, we take 1 over P prime outside. But for the region, we, we don't raise it to the P, but, but, but we have 1 over P prime outside. So we, we should divide the exponent by P prime. Right. Uh -huh. So that, that's how it's computed. Um, Okay, so that's for a transform. Oh, that, 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 that's the left hand side of this. For the right hand side of that, um, L2 of mu is just uh, f is the characteristic function of C delta. So that's just the volume of C delta to the, to the half, right? The power of half. And this should be delta to the n minus 1 over 2. Right. And now, um, OK, then let's suppose suppose that the statement here is true. Then what we need is that um, this should be bigger than this. Uh -huh. So we, we, we have this. If it's is if it were true, let's say. Um, okay. Um, then, then uh, all all the rest is to compute, you know, the, the power of the delta, so, so that the, the, this is always true as delta goes to zero. Um, you can see that uh, we have this right. This is greater than c delta m minus one minus m plus one over p prime. Um, and then this is true for all the, the data goes to zero. Um, so we need to make sure that m minus 1 over 2 is less than m minus 1 minus m plus 1 over p prime. Right. Uh, to, to just flip the direction. And th th this wall gives you uh, p prime is greater than or equals to 2m plus 2 over m minus 1. And this is equivalent to p less than you know two plus two over n plus three, which answers your question. Okay, and uh, I, I mentioned this example not only to answer your question, but also this is a very important example, um, which gives rise of the method um, by by using which we we prove the Kirchhoff conjecture uh, through the restriction conjecture. Okay. You, um, and uh, to, to point it out, let's see. So the, the important thing here is you, you can view this figure, um, the, this n-dimensional rectangle, as the dual shape of this cap in Rn. So be, because the forward transform of this cap is mostly concentrated on this rectangle. Because we prove it here, right? It, it, it's greater than equal to a half. So, and uh, and Kakea set is actually a set that contains a unit line segment on each direction. So, okay, um, so um, roughly speaking, you, you you can construct a set, you know, which is a sum of sum of. Uh, okay, let, let me first define this object. So, 
let me call this object, um, th this is the direction E. So, and uh, th this cube is centered at A. And uh, I want to say that this length is 1, and the width is the delta. And I, I will call such cylinder T delta. T, T delta A, right? delta E, the value at A. So A is w w where its location is, and delta is the width, and E is the direction. Okay. Um, and to, to consider um, capital sets, you can consider a function like sum of E to the 2 pi I A J dot X F E J uh, what are the, those ej and what are those aj? So, so basically, I would um, say that, that this is a sphere. I, I, I cover the sphere with a lot, lot of cap. <clears throat> Each cap has a center ej, right? So, th th this is where ej comes from, and aj is so th this term is a uh, translation term um, because by multiply your f by this vector you are translating the Fourier transform of it so the Fourier transform of this it, it is just this okay so by, by m multiplying this I, I, I'm actually moving to, it's dual shape in a frequency space I should do this. What? F E J? Uh, yeah, 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 of course. E J, right. Okay, so but basically by adding this term here, I'm, I'm just moving the Fourier transform of this function in a frequency space. Okay, and uh, so the sum of them will be, you know, um, a linear combination of uh, cylinders like this with translation provided by this number aj here. The Fourier transform of f. Yeah, okay, yeah. The, 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 the Fourier transform of f, if you consider the Fourier transform of f, it will be a linear combination of uh, cylinders with center at aj. So f ej is transform, right? We also transform like f ej, right? F ej is, FEJ is the identity function on the cap. Uh, C delta E J, the, the the cap centered at E J. So using the computation over there, you can think of the Fourier transform is taking the cap into a cylinder. So by do, doing this linear combination, it's like turning those cap into a cylinder and then translate them according to E J. So which corresponds to mm -hmm. the the P S. Right, right. But thank, thank you for the explanation. Right. So, but um. So, but, but the translation is still a big problem. So, um, that, that's why we will want to control um, those translations uh, by a so-called Kakeya maximal. Oh, no, sorry, um, the Kakeya maximal function operator. Uh, let's see. So, so now I will define this. Okay, um, maximal function. Okay, which is delta star e. Um, take it to be supremum of a in R n. A is my translation vector of. Th th this means average in integral, and I will explain it later. T E A F. So I'm considering the average of F on the, this cube. Um, so do you see that? So first of all, F delta star is a function from from the space of all direction to R. Right. So I, I fi fix the direction, and, uh, and the delta is also fixed. That, that that's that's how how wide my uh, cylinder is. So direction and width are fixed, 
and the length is all, always one, you, you can see from the direction, then I'm, I'm considering the average of absolute value of that on, on all this, this kind of cylinder and consider their supremum. So, um, okay. How to define for you what average means? Average just means literally average. So, uh, right, integral of f on this cube. Um, th this is one of the over the volume of the cube. Uh, no, sorry, one over the volume of the cylinder. Right. Okay, so th this is the uh, maximum function. So that get rid of the, the, the translation. Um, so that you only need to consider all possible that directions. Okay, but, but these are, are just vague idea. And uh, here is the Takeya maximal function conjecture. Well, which says that for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists um, Okay, uh, sorry. I think I will write this conjecture on the board. I, um, the definition is here. Um, so, it. so I'll start proving this. But let me give you the conjecture first. So, Ikea maximal function conjecture says that. For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists C and epsilon such that um, F delta star L n of mu is less than equal to C and epsilon delta to the power negative epsilon F L n of R n. So, order of order um, let me see. So th th this data agrees with this data down here. The full order. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, that's right. For all data, um, for all absolute there exist. Um, okay, maybe, maybe for, for all data. Okay. Um, okay, so one one thing to mention, okay, I, I I don't have time to give you an example to show you why I need this power here, but but I I can tell you why these power are just the dimension. So you can see the exponent is just dimension. That's because um, okay, let, let me write a definition here because we, we're gonna need it. Delta B. So you can see that th this is always less than the L infinity norm of f. So L infinity norm of f delta star is going to be less than L infinity norm of f. And if, if provided we know Ln norm is less than Ln norm, then by interpolation we have all the power in between. Right. So, so th this n actually provides another you know, n point of the interpolation trick. Okay, so so this side is, is actually true for all p, you know, greater than the dimension, less than infinity. Um, both endpoints include. Okay, now okay, um, what I'm gonna do, hopefully I, I can I can show you some um, idea from that. So well, what I'm gonna do now is um, I'm I'm gonna assume this conjecture and using this conjecture to prove um, KPSI conjecture. Because the, the proof of the, the, this conjecture is pretty uh, analysis, but it, it, if you're curious, I, I can provide you the paper. It, it's not very large, it's just two or three pages, but it, it, it's more involved, so I don't want to do it here. <laughs> and the, the, the time does not permit me to do that. So, uh, okay, so key, keep in mind that the cube is like this. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll draw it again here. So the cube is, this is T delta E of A, center at A, um, with direction E. So this lens is one, and this lens is, is the, the delta. So uh, that, that's how I divide that, that cylinder, T delta E A. 
Okay, then um, since now I want to prove it, so I, I, I first want to tell you, okay, what's the, okay, let, let me first tell you the, the definition of house of measure, although you, you might know it, but yeah, let me just remind a little bit. So um, the d dimensional house of measure is actually suprema delta greater than zero house of delta d of that set, which is, so, these are actually also measures. So HD is supremum of all those measures. And how are those measures defined? So here it is. It's infimum over all possible combinations, and you will see what that combination means. I form one to infinity diameter of UI. B union of UI um, contains E and uh, diameter u i is less than delta. So the, the, this delta actually, this delta down here actually controls the size of all sets I, I can choose in a covering. And if those sets together provide a covering for my e, then I evaluate you know, the diameter to the least power. And that, and, and then consider the infimum over all those possible coverings. That provides me to this measure. And then house of measure is the supreme of all the you know um, supreme of all the value Because uh, okay, you, you can also replace this by limit that goes to zero plus. They're, they're equivalent because by by shrinking delta you are actually shrinking the the admissible set, so the supreme is increasing. Uh, the income moment is increasing. Okay. So, okay. 10 minutes left. Um, so, we don't scale it so that it coincides with the left plate measure? Like, if D is an integer, mm -hmm. do we scale it so that it coincides with the plate measure? Um, because, like, here, it, D in this definition, is not the same as the plate measure. Right. The, here, here, they need not to be an integer. Did yeah, yeah, just no, but if, if it is an integer, this definition does not coincide with the Laplace form. It does. Unless it's scale it, right? Uh, okay, you're, you're, you're right, you're right. Oh, okay, so, so if you really, okay, so yeah, I'm being a little bit sl sloppy here because I really need a, a constant on um, alpha d. So alpha d ta takes care of the volume of the unit ball. So, here I just um, d d d deliberately forget this constant because I only care about the dimension. Right. Um, the, so for, for the dimension, the constant doesn't matter. Right. But, but, but you're right, that, that, that's a good point. So, uh, only when with this constant, then house of measure will agree with the like big measure, um, integer dimension. Okay. So then, <laughs> house of dimension, dimension is, it's just uh, supreme of all d. The supreme, okay. Supreme of all d such that uh, house of dimension of e is supreme of all d such that um, okay. H d of e as infinity. So well, what actually happens for, okay, if you fix a set, then you consider its house of measure with respect to uh, a bunch of different dimensions, then only one of them will be finite, non-zero but finite. At most one of them. Well, no. Up to, at some point, everything is zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so non-zero and finite, oh. I, I said. So, yeah, so well, what happens, okay, if you fix an E and you look at this, this graph, the, um, okay, I would say the horizontal axis is D, the vertical axis is the house of, dimension, uh, house of measure of E, so th this is the measure, this is D, then, then it's going to be zero uh, starting from one point and uh, afterwards. And it's going to be infinity 
for everything uh, up to this point, but not included. But at this point, which is the critical point we, we were curious about, that's defined to be our house of dimension. And at, at this point, the, the number could be infinity, could be zero, could be finite, it could be anything, non-negative. But um, it, it will be infinity before and zero afterwards. Okay. And that, that's why we define a dimension like, like that. And so, in order to prove that the clear set has house of measure n, we just need to prove for all s less than n, um, its house of measure it is infinity. Or, um, it suffices to show um, for all s less than n, house of measure s of <coughs> Uh, let's say if this E is my clear set, that's greater than equal to a constant. That, that's enough. I, I don't even need infinity because because once once it, it's greater than a constant, greater than zero, then you know um, it's gonna be infinity for all s. Uh, okay, I, I I guess you guys can see the argument, right? So um, uh, so once this is true, then for all the W less than S, we will really have that house of measure of W of E is going to be infinity by our graph over there. But, but, but W is any number less than S. S is any number less than N. So but that means for any W less than N, this is true. So we only need to prove that um, house of S dimension house of measure of E is greater than positive constant. Okay, and that's our goal, and then we only have five minutes left. <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, okay, sorry, I, I, I can't, uh, all right, it doesn't really matter. I'll erase some part of these. Um, choose So at least I'll give you the theorem that somehow provides the result. So um, assume f delta star l q l q norm. Of course, this will be a l q norm on s n minus one, right? Because this is defined on s d. Less than um, c delta to the negative epsilon. After LP, then, then, um, Kaya set has dimension on at least M minus P epsilon. So, and, uh, and by our con conjecture here, we know that, that that is actually true for all epsilon. So we can conclude that the dimension is um, n. Okay. You can see that th th this is actually true for all epsilon greater than zero. So yeah. So while, while, once that theorem is true, then so still for every dimension. Uh, right, right, right. Okay. Um, so, okay. Maybe, okay, I'll, I'll erase it. Um, okay, so now the, the idea is that, um, the idea is that, okay, in order to prove house of dimension, we need to pick a covering, right? Um, let's say our covering is, is this Vj, which is, the ball x j r j. So here I'm I'm reducing my range from all possible sets to a set of balls because that will not change, you know, the dimension of the set. Okay, because because the diameter of arbitrary ball, uh, the, the, the diameter of an arbitrary set and the diameter of a ball 
um, is comparable um, when Okay, when, when their diameter is comparable, their volume is comparable. So I, uh, I can re restrict my um, target set to all possible balls. So now I, I just replace my covering by balls. Um, and then let's say, let's see. Um, Then I'll call sigma k to be the set of j such that uh, the radius is between 2 to the ne negative k and 2 to the negative k plus 1. Okay. So that, that's the set of indices. And uh, so let me call the union of, okay, so these balls are, these are bj. So let me define ek to be union of bj, um, j belongs to sigma k um, intersect with e, my criteria set. And ek tilde to be union of bj tilde j belongs to sigma k. Uh, what, what is dj tilde? Oh, so, sorry, sorry. It, it should, should be b. b bj and, and b, bj tilde. So what is bj tilde? bj tilde is as you enlarge each ball um, by enlarge its radius to twice of that. So these are bj tilde. So th th this is 2rj. This is Rj, and Ej is just the union though, well, without intersection with E. Okay, and and the interesting fact is that um, I think I'm gonna erase this. Yeah, I I have to erase this anyway. Then by, by pigeonhole principle, first of all, um, okay. For, for first of all, for all e, there exists x e rise such that x e plus t e is in our e for all t uh, between neg negative half and half. Right. So that that's the definition of KSS. Okay, right. And then um, by pigeonhole principle. For all e, there exists k e such that okay, the, the, this is the crucial step. Um, t between half, one half and half x e plus t e belongs to e k. So I'm um, actually considering the, the, the this set. So for all fixed e, so for for, for fixed e, I can consider the k. Um, I can consider k and the corresponding ek and look at how much of that unit line segment lies within ek. Right? I'm, I'm looking at the length of it. And, and I say that th this has to be greater than c over k squared. So I claim there exists such k corresponding to e, such that um, the intersection of ek and that unit line segment has length greater than C over K squared. Why is that? Because, because um, here is C actually is uh, something like pi squared over, over 6, the, the, the sum of 1 over n squared. So if the, 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 this is not true for all K, then the sum of them would be less than 1, where, which is a contradiction with the fact that, okay, um, that line segment has less than one. Okay. Right. Okay. So now we have the mapping from E to K E. So the, the second step is again pigeon pigeonhole principle. We look at the omega K 
such that um, uh, omega k is the set of all directions such, such that uh, k such that ke equals to k. You, you, you can see that since there are okay, uh, only countably many uh, no. Uh, oh yeah, only countably many k and uncountably many e. So there must be two two different e's located in one or omega k, right? Okay, the, 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 the last two trivial, but, but here is the interesting fact. So there exists k such that the measure of omega k is greater than c over k squared. Again, the, the same idea, right? Because we know the union of them has volume, um, you know, it, it's a fixed number, the, the volume of the union is sphere. So, so my, my C is just like one over the volume of the union sphere. And if, if the, the, this fact is not true, that would imply that the sum of omega k is gonna be less than the volume of the union sphere, which is impossible. So again, by pigeonhole principle, um, this second statement is also true, right? Okay, and this is extremely important because then we, we, we can almost finish our proof by saying that, um, okay, I'm, I'm gonna fix this K. Um, I, I apologize that I, I, I might use at, at most five more minutes and, I, and then I'll finish. Take your time, take your time. Yeah, because I, I didn't know that I spent so much time on, on the, you know, at a measure. Is it easy to see sigma k is measurable? Ah, sigma k. You, 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 you mean oh, omega, oh, omega k. Omega k is measurable. Um, omega k is the set that... Okay, it, it, it's actually not easy because, because you really... Okay, I didn't really think about that before. Four, but that, that really depends on how how, how, how you choose KE. So I think it's okay. right. So it's fine. So yeah. for, for probably we need to be careful about that. Yeah. But, yeah. 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 Oh. Uh, All right. I, I'll, I'll continue and get back to this point later. So. Um, here, claim that for all E belongs to omega K. So K, K is fixed. K is the case that is like that property. Um, T E to the net value of K, um, X E intersect E K tilde is going to be greater than, greater than C over K squared over the volume of that so th th this is saying that um, how so we're, we're looking at how much e k tilde occupies this cylinder, and we claim that it occupies at, at least c over k squared portion of that. And why is that? Because if you if you look at e k, if you look at e k, we we know that for all e belongs to omega k, k e is equal to k. What does that mean? That that means for all e belongs to omega k, this is true. So, why well, why is that? Because the fixed e, we know that we know that um, um, e k in, intersect the, the the unit line segment at the, the direction e is at least c over k squared. And, and we also know that e k tilde, so, so let, let me draw a picture here. This is the cube, this is the line segment on the direction e, and e k might intersect in the, this way, in a very weird way, so e k the, does not occupy much of the cylinder, but as for ek tilde, it is the enlarged version of ek. So as long as ek intersects with this union line segment on this line segment, 
then EK total is going to contain the, the whole uh, cylindrical part generated by this um, line segment here. Right. So that, that means as long as your EK occupy that portion of the unit length, your EK tilde will occupy at least the same portion of this, this cylinder. Also, it relies on the that the size of the ball is comparable to the size the, the width of the tube. Right, so right, right, right. That's the reason right. you want to do the pressure on principle in the first place. Right, right, right. So, so what 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 we're really pointing out is that um, here the, the the size is two to the ne negative k. I'm always looking at on this length scale, and also. And also, what's the other? Let's see. Um, right. Uh, and, and and also, the width of the cube is two to the ne negative k. So this part is two to the negative k. And also, we know how much we, we enlarge that. We are enlarge part rj. Rj is like two to the negative k. So we know, okay, since the width of the cylinder is two to the ne negative k, and we enlarge it by two to the negative k. So, so the cylindrical portion like this is going to be in EK two. So the claim is true. Okay. One, well, once the claim is true, then the fall, well, what follows is just computation. Uh, so then, then you the choose that have to be characteristic function of EK two. Then, then. Um, This is just the definition of f delta star. Because the, the, the definition of f delta star is that, OK, um, I'm, I'm considered the supreme of all different translations. Then I'm evaluating the average of f on each cube. And now I, I do, do have a cube so, so that um, the average of f on it is greater than c over k squared. So for all e, belongs to omega k, this maximal function is going to be greater than c over k squared. That, that just follows from the definition. All right. Um, right. Um, t a delta e. OK. But but then okay from from our previous conjecture, uh, in other words, the maximal KKK maximal function conjecture, we know that th this is less than um, two a constant times k squared two to the k epsilon um, f l p norm to the q. Um, the, the, this just falls by Markov inequality um, from the conjecture. You can easily do that by yourself. It is just Markov property, nothing is. Um, then, if you plug in where your f is, uh, your f is this. So, this gives you c to the k squared, 2 to the k epsilon. <coughs> then, what I need here is. The number of sigma k, 2 to the negative kn, 1 over p to the q. Um, the, the, this is how much q, uh, how, how much how much balls are there in your ek tilde. And the, the, this is the volume of each q. OK. Um, so then, so OK. This is greater than this. This is less than this. So this should be greater than this. And then you, you you will get that sigma k is greater than okay k to the some power times two to the k times okay th th this power is important m minus p epsilon. So then sum of R J S, which is the house of measure we're looking at, is greater than or equals to so S is the dimension something less than n minus p epsilon. 
a sum is smaller than that. This is going to be greater than sigma k, the number of cubes times 2 to the negative ks. So that, that's going to be greater than or equals to um, k to the sum positive, uh, k to the sum negative power times e to the, okay, let me write out what it is. So k, uh, 2 to the k and minus p epsilon minus x. So this is something positive, and this is something negative. If you minimize the, the, this function over all possible case, this is always greater than equal to the constant. So view k at, as, a, as a variable, and view the other number at, as a constant, then th this is always greater than equal to the positive constant. And th that just proves the theorem, because because this is true for all s less than m minus p epsilon. That means the dimension is, is at least m minus p epsilon. But, but, but this is true for all epsilon. So, yeah. Okay, that, that's all. Thank you very much. Do you guys have any questions? So, oh, is the Hausdorff method? Allowed to have like value other than zero and infinite? Uh, yeah, yes, of course. So a, a very important fact is that house of measure, as Kevin mentioned, house of measure agrees with with Lovic measure on um, integer dimension. So it's just Lovic measure where I mean because it's integer. So we we define the house of dimension as like the supremum that supremum of like the number and then that has like. Uh, infinite, infinite value, right? So, uh -huh, uh -huh. so house of dimension is the so um, the, the the graph is like infinity at the beginning, zero afterwards, and there is some critical value in between, right? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, what if our like set E has like finite value? And then oh, they just say. Um, Say so e is R n. Then house of dimension is also n, but the house of dimension of R n is never finite, but non zero. I mean, yeah. we, we can tell about like the. I, I, I mean, house of measure of R n is never something between zero and infinity for all s. Right, so so you couldn't say, uh, okay, I choose the one with finite dimension. There might not be such number. So we are trying to find like some dimension of subset of R n, right? Like that the like I said that, that is dimension like subset of some R n, and then uh -huh. so we are trying to find some dimension. But I mean, I I'm talking about like if we have like really trivial so like ball or something, then we can measure the dimension of the ball. But I mean, I th I feel like if we have just regular ball, our the how Hausdorff measure is like just finite. So, I mean, in that case, like how can we like prove that point? What the I want to define the, the measure. But I, I mean, I don't think so. Uh, so you you are taking a ball, say in three dimension, and then the Hausdorff measure of the ball will coincide with uh, right, the back measure. measure. But then if you uh, take a d in that definition less than three, then we'll get infinity always. Mm. So the picture is like so, infinity so that, that is and less than three, three. you get um, finite. Okay. 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 Any other question? All right. I'll, I apologize for like keeping you guys here uh, for so long, but thank you for attention.